The God that we serve is a God that likes to move you to the next. Because he is a God of transition. Shout transition. He will never leave Joseph in a pit. He moves him into a palace because all along God had a destiny for him. And although you walk through valleys and you walk through deserts in life, the destination is not the valley. The destination is not the desert. The destination is always the promised land. Say God is a God of transition. You were never created to stay stuck in your walk with God. Say I was not created to be stuck. Say it again. I was not created to be stuck by anything in your life. Stuck emotionally, stuck mentally. My job and assignment on the earth is to pull people from being stuck. You were always called and created to move ahead. You know, I look at animals and for whatever reason, uh, we domesticate animals. I mean, thank God for that because I love my cat. But animals were never created to be in cages. When you look at a bird, a bird was never created to be in a cage while somebody enjoys looking at their little birdie every morning. Birds were created, and this in no way is to <laughs> let your bird go, but what I'm trying to say is that animals were created to be in the wild, and they were never created to be domesticated. Nowadays, we have zoos. We love zoos, but we encage what it's supposed to be free all the while we enjoy it right at the expense of their domestication so we go to the zoo and somebody will always benefit from the captivity the enemy benefits from your captivity he likes to watch you be encaged in your own emotions but you were never a people that were created to be bound by anything and caged by anything, bound by anything. You were created to be free in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what it takes to get free. You were created to be free. If it is through a preaching, you've got to be determined people to get out. Out of what the enemy has encaged you in. Because the plan of the enemy is to encage you emotionally spiritually but God is a God of transitions shout God is a God of transitions you cannot stay in your bondage you cannot stay emotionally bound you cannot stay in the pain you cannot stay in a previous season you've got to transition to the next you cannot stay in an old belief system you've got to transition to the next he who has an ear let him hear to what God is saying you cannot stay in your cave. You've got to come out of your cave and stop bleeding. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Elijah. God visited Elijah. And God told Elijah, what are you doing here? Because you were not born for that Elijah. Once Jezebel began to attack him, he said, what are you doing here? You're called a sore Elijah. Get out of the cave. I never called you to stay there. You've got to come out of whatever has domesticated you. And you've got to move on to the next. Shout next. Because a lot of times what happens to us is that we put so much energy into situations, into seasons that we were never supposed to stay in. We put energy into the fear that we were come, supposed to come out of. We put energy into self-rejection when we were supposed to come out of that. And many people are putting energy into the wrong thing. That's why it's very important, hear me, that you judge nobody. <laughs> you know why you can't judge anybody? Because everybody has the ability to start over. Everybody. Shout everybody has the ability to start again. Yeah, that if there was a previous season in your life that went sour, you didn't do it right, there's always a reset button and a start over button. Yeah. That's why you can't judge anybody. That's why sometimes you have to reintroduce yourself to people. 
I hadn't seen the gentleman that hosted me in this conference for 10 years. The last time I saw him was 10 years ago. And he said, Apostle, you're not the same person. That's right. I got to reintroduce myself. Because every year you have to come out. You have to be renewed. You have to move and step into what God has for you. Amen. Amen. That's called the mercy of God. <laughs> You've got to love the mercy of God. But everybody has a right to start over. That's why you shouldn't judge anybody. Because God can start over in their lives. Like God is starting over in a lot of your lives. You want to know why? You can give it to him if you want. Do you want to know why curses follow people? Curses follow people because they're bringing the old into something new. And it's not the devil that's doing it. It's that you're cursing yourself because you're trying to bring the old into the new. But thank God for second chances. But thank God for third chances. But thank God for start overs. But thank God for his mercy. But thank God that he's got mercy upon him. So you know what we have to do? You and I have to shut off everything that will not transform in our lives. You have to shut off everything that will not change in your life. You've got to cut it off. Shout, cut it off. When you look at a chicken, a chicken cannot change without shattering the egg that it was held in. If you look at a seed, a seed must shatter the shell out externally in order to become a tree. Blind Bartimaeus, the Bible says, has to let go of a coat so he can enter into the new. A woman by the name, well, we don't know her name, but she's a Samaritan woman, has to drop her, her pots to enter into the new. We all have to let go of something to enter into the new of God. Snakes have to shed their skin. Dogs and cats have to shed their hair. Eagles pluck their feathers so that they can renew. They've got to, they've got to break their beak so that they can grow a new one. Worms have to shed their cocoon so that they can access the new wings that were there all along. You have to want it bad enough, the new of God. There is something in you that God wants to bring forth in this next season. But until you're willing to shatter the old, cut off the old, then God cannot bring the new. You have to want it bad enough. Paul said it like this. I forget the things which are behind so that I can reach for those things that are ahead. You cannot reach for the things that are ahead looking back and reaching for the things in the past. This, you have to understand, the new of God in your life. Because your second half is better than the first half. Yeah. And it's going to, you have to realize something that it's going to be worth it. That what's in front of you is better than what was behind you. Shout new wine. New wine. Jesus tells us he cannot give us the new wine. Until we get rid of the old wineskin. Then he can put in new wine into what was, what was once old. It became new. Read with me Joel 2. We're going to read and we're going to skip. But we're going to read verse 19. Chapter 2 verse 19. And if you can, please read out loud. The word of the Lord says as follows. Then the Lord will reply, found in Joel 2. Look, I am sending you. Uh -huh, what is he sending you? grain and what and olive oil enough you will no longer be an object of mockery somebody got to call a family member <laughs> among the surrounding nations now verse 25 look what it says the Lord who says it the Lord, the Lord. he said I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locusts, to the hopping locusts, to the stripping locusts, and the cutting locusts. It was I who sent this great destroying army against you. Once again, shall once again. You will have all the food you want, and you will praise the Lord your God. 
who does these miracles for you, never again will my people be disgraced. Then, shout then, you will know that I am among my people Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Never again will my people be disgraced. Read 28, please. Then, after doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants. Men. No, no, the religious person has to hear that. Men and. Amen. So here Joel is telling us about the new wine. And he says that a new wine is coming that's going to satisfy you, that will meet all of your needs, that will remove the scorn, the shame, the disgrace that was on your life. In other words, what he was saying, that in the last days, according to even Ezra, according to Ezekiel, according to Isaiah, these were all prophetic people that told us the end times. He said, in the last day, my presence is going to increase. The latter glory is going to be poured out. And God is going to pour out a new wine. Shout a new wine. new wine. Even when Israel, Israel is a shadow of us. When Israel is coming out of Egypt and they go scope out the land, God sends 12 spies to go scope out the land that they were supposed to transition into. They were not called to stay in a desert. They were supposed to transition into a promised land. He sends 12 spies. Shout 12 spies. And when they go and scope out the land for 40 days, they're scoping out what is happening in Canaan. The Bible says that these men came back with this vine of grapes. It was so large. It was so grand. It was so big that it took so many men to carry it with the pole. And it was grapes signifying the end time new wine that is coming upon the earth. He will say, in your promised land, it will take so many people to carry that. Because it's so heavy. It's so weighty. In other words, the blessings that await you, you cannot carry it on your own. It will require you, because grapes represent new wine in the Bible. So he was saying, there will be no more manna. There will be no more water. It is time for abundance. It is time for abundance of his presence. Abundance of what God has. Here's the prophet Joel. And Joel prophesizes to us that there's going to be an overflow of the oil and the new wine. If you study Joel chapter 2, it's talking to us about the end times. He said, never again will my people be ashamed. But there's a new wine. The first miracle that ever occurred that Jesus did, it wasn't his time. It was not a deliverance. It was not a healing. It was not changing a person or, or resurrecting them or healing them from leprosy. It wasn't some other miracle like healing the eyesight. The miracle that Jesus brought first is to convert water into wine. Because wine is significant of something. Wine represents a new time. Huh. A new season in your life. A new in your life. A new wine represents a time in your life where you're about to conquer. <laughs> the things that you have been praying about for so long are about to be manifested. It is a time for miracles. New wine represents a new season of miracles. A new season of wonders. A new season of healings. Of healing an old wound. Of destroying the oppression that had you in bondage. New wine is a new season. It is a new time. It is a new outpour. It is a new presence. It is a new glory. It is a new time of conquering from victory to victory. It is a new season in your life. The things that maybe the enemy stole, the new wine comes to restore what the enemy stole. When Jesus enters the synagogue, he begins to open the scrolls. And the first thing that Jesus reads is the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to preach the good news 
to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, and to set the captives free. Look at Jeremiah 31, 12. The word of the Lord says, they will come. Look at Jeremiah's prophesying it. He says, they will come home and what? Sing songs of joy on the heights of Jerusalem. They will be, what are you going to be? Uh-huh. Because of the Lord's, look at this, the abundant crops of grain, the new wine, and olive oil, and the healthy, oh, Jesus, I just saw something. the flocks are about to be healthy. Uh, no more hurting flocks, no more wounded flocks uh, in the new wine. <laughs> Say, I'm healthy. Emotionally, I'm healthy. Spiritually, we're healthy. You're healthy physically. Look what it says. Their life will be like a watered garden. Why? Because of the new wine. And look what it says in 13. The young women will dance for joy. And the men, old and young, will join in the celebration. I... He's about to turn your morning into joy. I know you've had some, some morning in your previous seasons, but when the new wine comes, he turns the morning into joy. I will comfort them and exchange their sorrow for rejoicing. It says the priests will enjoy abundance. You are the priests. The Bible says you are kings and priests. And my people will what? Feast on my good gifts. I, the Lord. Who's spoken? The Lord is the Lord of covenant. And when he speaks, so it shall be. And nothing can stop what the word of the Lord has already promised. So hear this. It says that God redeems. Joel 2, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all the prophets are talking about a time of redemption. Meaning that everything that the devil has been stealing in your life for so long. In the new wine, you're about to recuperate it. You're about, you're about to redeem some things. So everything, yes, Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus has come to give you life. And he comes to restore all things. And he comes to redeem all things. That means it doesn't have to end with Satan steal, kill, and to destroy. And it ends with Jesus redeeming what was stolen. What the enemy stole. Now some of those things that he stole you can have. But some of the things <laughs> that I need to redeem, then they're mine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the new wine, what does it represent? The new wine represents a time of restitution for you. It's a time of recompense. That's why he says, I'm going to restore the years. If, the, if you feel like you have lost years, he's about to restore your years. The new wine comes to restore years that the locust stole, the canker worm stole, the palmer worm stole, meaning it is a time of restitution. Amen. Say restitution. restitution. The new wine represents abundance, shed abundance. The Bible says that the spies, they looked at the grapes and they said, we can't carry it. Because it's so big, it took many men to have to carry those grapes. Because it was abundance. You're about to enter into not just abundance externally. What good is it to have all the success externally, but inside you're hurting and you're unhealthy. When I speak of abundance, abundance means in every aspect you are prospering. Amen. That is what awaits you. But we have to get rid of the old. To get the new. You know what new wine means? It means a time that you're finally going to conquer things. That has taken you years. You couldn't do it. You couldn't attain it in your own ability. There were seasons of drought. Seasons of famines in your life. But the new wine comes to conquer. What does it mean? It, the new wine means a time of God's fulfillment. Of the promises that he has for you. It is a time of overflow in his presence. If you have been experiencing his presence as you come to our service, you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus said something to us, however. He said, I cannot put the new 
into an old wineskin. He said it will require the new wine is going to require for you to be restored from the old to the new. And the new wine, why did he tell us that? Because the new wine has characteristics. The new wine comes with abundance. And you may think you're ready, but if you don't get your skins ready, you are not going to be able to support what God wants to release. Ugh. So the new wine has characteristics. The new wine expands. The new wine multiplies. The new wine is heavy. The new wine is overflowing. The new wine will break the old wine skin and it will not preserve you. Let me tell you something about wine skins. Shout wine skins. A new wine skin can expand. I wish I had an example for you. But a new wine skin is able to expand. It's able to hold both the wine and the gases that come from that wine. But an older wine skin cannot sustain or hold on to the, the new wine. So Jesus is saying to us, you and I, I need to restore the old wine skin in your life. That has to be a priority. Before I bring in the new in your life, I've got to restore you. You know how they restored old wine skins? Hear me. In the physical, they would take an old wine skin so that it can be made new. They would take the old wine skin. They didn't throw it out. They would restore it. So guess what? God in his mercy is saying to the body of Christ globally, I am not going to throw you out. I'm going to restore you. Amen. You know, God in his mercy, watch this. God in his mercy is saying to you and I, I'm, you're not some case that is so difficult that I can't restore. Let me explain how they restored an old wineskin. An old wineskin wasn't thrown out. An old wineskin wasn't thrown into the trash. An old wineskin had to undergo a process so that it can become a new wineskin. How did the old wineskin become a new wineskin? Let me tell you. Number one, they would begin to cleanse it. They had to stick it in a water and they would dip it and soak it in water for a long time till it starts to get soft again let me remind you of the message that God has given us about going into the deep of God hmm. because you cannot become a new wineskin living in an old presence living in a presence that is shallow to become a new wineskin you must soak in the presence of God again you must live in the presence of God again the Bible says that Jesus is the living water and you have to soak in the presence until you are cleansed from the old. And then once it's submerged and soaked in water, you know what they do? After it's been soaked, they immediately apply oil to it. Oil in the Bible represents the presence of God. Meaning God is saying, I'm going to put a presence over your life that is going to bring restoration back to your life. So what God does to restore us is that he puts us and increases the presence. Why? So that you and I can, be go, can begin to go back into the presence of God and can be restored to a new wineskin. Once it's got oil, they stretch it. Oh. They stretch and stretch and stretch the old wineskin so that it can become soft again. If they put water, they cleanse it. To the oil and then they stretch it. And all the wineskin is not thrown away. It can be made new. So if you felt the conviction of Wednesday, there's mercy and there's hope. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the word new, shout new, in the Greek does not signify new and old. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean age. You're old, I'm young. No, it doesn't mean age. But the word new and the word old in the Greek, according to that scripture, it means nature and your essence. In other words, what you're carrying. 
I said something when I was in the conference. I said, you can have all the gifts in the world, but if you don't have an essence inside of you, that you can't fake. Preachers can be so gifted to preach, but it's what you carry, you release. That you can't fake. All of us, shout all of us, we all have an essence. When I is in that conference, a lot of these people had never felt God's presence like that. I cannot release something I don't carry. I can only release what I carry. And what God does when he brings a restoration from the old to the new is not only does he cleanse you, deliver you, he heals you, he restores you. As long as you're soaking in the presence of God, then what happens is God comes and he puts an essence on you. A new essence. So you're no longer carrying the old bitterness, the old offense, the old anger, the old thoughts. What happens is now you carry an essence of the glory of God. So when you see the word new and old, he's talking about an essence, not an age. New wineskins, shout new wineskins. They are elastic like. They're full of oils. When you study a new wineskin, a new wineskin is full of oils, meaning the presence of God. They're flexible. They're thick, meaning they're not weak. They are flexible, but they're also thick. A new wineskin is thick, meaning you can put them through the fire and they will not break. A new wineskin can overcome any desert, any trial, because they're full of the oil of God. They can walk through any attack. They can walk through any affliction. In the good day and in the bad day, they remain a new wineskin. But an old wineskin is not easily stretched. You can't stretch it. It cannot be stretched. As a matter of fact, an old wineskin, when you study it physically, it is thin, meaning they break easily. Can't tell them anything because they're so fragile. Brittle. Can't correct because they're brittle. They lack the necessary capacity to be able to withstand the heat of battle. The older nature in your life, because you have an old nature and a new nature. You cannot, that old nature cannot hold the new. Look what Ephesians 4, 22 to 23 says out loud. It says, put away the older person uh, that you used to be. Have, help me church, have nothing to do with the old sinful life. It was sinful because of being fooled into bad or following bad desires. Let your minds Can you give Jesus a praise? What is he telling us? He said, you're going to have to put away some things to be made new. Those desires that you have, you're going to have to put them away. The old man, the fact that you came to Jesus doesn't mean, yes, you're a new man, a new creature. But that old man tries to be resurrected sometimes. And you have to make sure that that old man stays in the grave. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he said, let your minds and your hearts be made new. You cannot receive the new with an old mind. You cannot receive the new with an old heart. Your heart has to be made new and your mind has to be made new. Because the new nature will be able to withstand and hold the growth that is coming, the good fruit that is coming, the character that is coming, the healing that is coming, the maturity that is coming over your life, the abundance that is coming, the conquering that is coming, the new presence that is coming, only the new nature will be able to hold it. So why do people not change? Why do they not change into the new? I'll tell you why. Let's go quickly. The reason why people do not change is because they don't want to make the sacrifice. Change is not automatic because you came to church. Change is deliberate. Change takes effort. Why do people not change? Because they don't want to make the sacrifice. They want somebody else to do it. 
or they want to blame something else for their own mishaps. Hear what I'm saying today, church. We desire the new. We want the new. You're sitting listening to me across the nations. You want the new. But the fact that you want it doesn't mean you're going to change. Because sometimes we want it, but we're not willing to release the old. And in order to release the old, you have to desire the new. We want to change. Every, if I asked the question and I did a survey, how many of you want the new of God, the abundance of God, the conquering of God? But the fact that you desire the new doesn't mean that you're going to let go of the old. Because change is not by osmosis. Change takes sacrifice. Yes. And the new and the old in your life cannot coexist. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He said, put off the old nature. We choose to change. It's not up to your apostle. It is not up to your pastor. It is up to you. That responsibility, that responsibility has to go back to you. Shout, it's my choice. And here, Ephesians tells us, I need a new what? Heart. And I need a what? Mind. And then I need to take action. And that gives you the new wineskin. A new wineskin is a new heart and a new mind and changed actions. Oh, I'm going to say that again. That's so good. I gave you a mouthful right there. The new wineskin is a new heart, a new mind, and a new change of actions. Don't tell me you want to serve God. Don't tell me you want to be on fire for God unless you're willing to sacrifice to get that new. Thank you so much for tuning in. We pray that these messages were a blessing to each and to every one of you. And we also pray that you consider partnering with us so that these messages can continue to reach people all across the earth. You will find the link in the description. Thank you so much. Blessings.